Okay, uh, good morning everyone, uh, it's good to be here. Um, getting the NHS to, to net zero is going to be a major undertaking uh, with some huge challenges, but it also presents a massive opportunity uh, for an NHS that treats patients better and is, is cheaper to run and, and healthier for the people who work in it. Um, I'm concentrating on our net zero effort at WSP with the NHS being a, a key focus area for reasons that will become clear in a moment. Um, I spend a lot of my time working with organisations, public and private, uh, including the NHS on how to get to net zero. What I'm going to try and do is introduce what the NHS is setting out to do, in England at least, the scale of the challenge and then how we can go about addressing it. In, next slide please, Chantal. Oh, and click again. All right, see the steps. Uh, and, and one more click. Brilliant, thank you. So, so to date, um, uh, sorry, this is set out in the NHS um, Net Zero Strategy document. You can see there on the right that was released just before Christmas, and it's um, some really good stuff in there. And the first one is the the baseline that the analysis that he did showed there's been a 62% reduction in CO2 emissions in the NHS since 1990, which is faster than the the rest of the country as a whole. So, fairly good news there. It also sets out two targets for for the NHS and. First, it sets out for the emissions that the NHS controls directly, a target to be net zero by 2040, and then a, um, an 80% reduction by 2032. And then for what they're calling the NHS Carbon Footprint Plus, which is essentially is the wider supply chain, that's the target to be net zero by 2045, uh, and with an 80% reduction by 2039. So, next slide, please. So, what is net zero? Next slide, please. So it's generally defined as a simple calculation um, that any CO2 emissions on an annual basis from an organization or development or building are balanced out by zero carbon generation capture or offsets. Uh, there are some issues with that methodology around its staticness and we're, and we're investigating that, but, but for broad terms, that's, that's how it works. Now, this image you can see on the screen is taken from the, the NHS strategy document I just referenced. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and it shows the area in the white box there on the left is what is considered under the NHS control directly. And that's the kind of things that most organisations would expect. So electricity use on the facilities, uh, gas use in, in heating and so on, uh, fleet vehicles, that kind of thing. There's some specialities around the NHS around things like meter dose inhalers, which are a, a very large uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions. And then outside the white box, you've got what they're calling the NHS Carbon Footprint Plus, which includes essentially the supply chain. So that's, those are sort of, that's the division between the two. Next slide, please. So I've, I've just got two graphs I wanted to illustrate that, that partly sort of show how, they're, how we're addressing this, but also the scale of the challenge. So this graph is um, a plan for, for the NHS direct emissions. And you can see there, if you look at the bottom of the graph, you've got 2008. So there's been steady decline in the in the CO2 emissions from the NHS, and that's what this graph showing. And if you come to the point where we are today, which is 2021, um, you can see just where the dotted lines start, we've got about six and a half megatons of CO2 per annum. That's more than Birmingham. That's more than the whole of Birmingham, and that's just the NHS direct estate. So you can see it really is genuinely huge, which is why there's such an area of focus. In the strategy, they what they've drawn is a dotted line here. You can see at the top. Um, and that shows the, the projection of what would happen if we did nothing. So just allowing the, the NHS to continue without any focus on decarbonisation at all. And then the bottom dotted line you can see is the trajectory you're aiming for, which is what we want to achieve. And then in between you've got these coloured bands and essentially they show the contribution from different elements to making that gap up, to, to making that transition. And that includes electrical grid decarbonisation, preventative healthcare to, to reduce the, uh, the amount of healthcare that's required. A lot of this, uh, pieces around low carbon inhalers, as I was mentioning. Then you've got transport and buildings in yellow and purple, which is, which is a big part of it. And then the grey area, you've got research, innovation and offsetting, which is um, essentially TBC, but will we'll kick in in the late 2020s. Next slide, please. So again, I, I, I won't bore you too much with this one, the graph as well, but I just wanted to illustrate it again. So this is the NHS, the same graph, but it now includes the supply chain, so that NHS Plus, as we're calling it. And just, just focus on where we are today in 2020, there's about 25, 26 megatons of CO2. That's, that's the same size as London, as, as a, a source of emission. It's, it's genuinely huge. And I, I won't go into any more details on the graph, you can, you can read it in the strategy, but it's essentially the same points, but with the supply chain added. So next slide, please, Chantal. 
And so next slide. I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is focus mainly on existing trusts and then mention the, the new NHS standard around net zero. But a lot of what I'm about to say would, would apply equally for, for new build as well as it does for, for existing. So what I've got here is a picture of the Royal Shrewsbury Hotel, uh, not hotel, uh, Royal Shrewsbury Hospital. Um, and not for any particular reason, not, not that we're working on this right now, but it's just I, I found it a, a good image to illustrate an estate in one picture, so uh, I've used it for that. And around that, I've shown um, 11 areas that we would focus on when focusing on a net zero strategy for, for a trust or, or an estate. And because of the time, I haven't, I won't go to all 11, but we can talk about them afterwards in questions if, if people are interested. But I thought I'd focus on some of the really big, big pieces of the puzzle. And, and number one I would start off with is, is heating. Um, in, in hospitals, it's quite common, I'd say it's pretty much standard for, the, for them to be heated by gas, often with gas boilers and combined heating power units, and often by steam systems. Um, and that, which is the case on this estate, actually, you can see on the far right there, towards the top, you've got the plant complex there with the flu um, showing with the gas CHP and, and, and gas boilers in there. Any net zero strategy, you're going to have to replace those um, eventually because, of course, gas is a significant source of CO2 emissions. At the moment, the re really the only option is to replace them with heat pumps. Now, the heat pumps are fantastic. They're electric. They're very low carbon. They'll get lower carbon as the grid decarbonizes. They, they don't emit any air pollution. So, so, so they're fantastic. But the challenge is that they are it is difficult to use them to directly replace it, steam systems and, and even uh, conventional low temperature hot water systems and so there's a lot of work going on in that and our, and our many teams are, are doing a lot of work in exactly that subject and this heat pump technology is moving on very rapidly but it's, it was definitely a major challenge and I'll put that number one on my list for any state. Uh, a second one that's another wonderful opportunity I think is transport so this, there's a wonderful opportunity to, to replace staff vehicles, ambulances, delivery vehicles, intrasite vehicles um, with electric alternatives. And again, there's fantastic benefits, much reduced air pollution, lower noise, much more reliable, cheaper to run. But it's, it's all fantastic. Uh, and they're even dropping in price to the point where they'll soon reach parity with, with fossil fuel vehicles. A major challenge we're seeing is for, for sites is that of course when you put lots of electric vehicle charging into a site that they will need there, there, there's a risk you'll exceed your capacity on that site and so that's a major challenge particularly where you've got emergency vehicles that might need to challenge might need to charge quite fast and and then you've got and you can see it on this site particularly more than half the site is actually a car park if you start adding visitor parking um, charging as well it could be a huge problem there are ways around it but it's, again it's something we would really focus on addressing early on um, a, couple, a couple of others, renewable energy, I mean, solar is always a, a good opportunity and you can see opportunities for here on this site. Um, I provide a modest contribution, but, but because solar is reliable and simple and doesn't interfere with systems, it's always a, a good option. Same with things like LED lighting. LED lighting is you know, fantastic in terms of much, much longer life, better quality of light, much cheaper to run. And, and solar and LED are good instances where it, it is possible to bring in third party finance quite easily because it's easy to measure the benefit, easy to calculate that benefit. So, so there is some good areas to focus on there. And there are others, like I say, fabric is, is could be challenging in hospitals, but there are opportunities. Um, three I did want to quickly mention was on any strategy, offsetting, you can see there on the left, is, is going to be an issue. For most trusts, offsetting of some kind is likely to be required, depending on when your target is and so on. And I think that brings in a small p politics that you need to consider right at the start in terms of what's going to be acceptable in terms of offsetting, how direct does it need to be, what schemes are you going to accept and so on. And then behaviour change is, is, is important. It's an important part of the strategy actually, I'll we'll come on to in a moment, where we talk about buy-in, so making sure everyone's involved in the in development the strategy. But there's already good, good research in the NHS around behaviour change programmes developing, sorry, delivering uh, significant, if, if modest, um, energy savings. But it, but it helps to engage um, and make people more articulate in how the energy systems of a building work, which have long-term benefits. And then finally, I wanted to focus on systems management, what we call 360 energy. Can you click the next slide, please? So um, we developed our 360 energy approach in, in light of two major trends we're seeing. The first is the increase in electrification of heat and transport. So, um, as, as was mentioned on the previous slide, so increasingly more and more systems are electric and therefore they interact more and more. 
Um, and the second, the second trend we're seeing is the, the increasing mixing of supply and demand. So increasingly, the old days of where you'd have a, an NHS trust that was just trying to be energy efficient to reduce its demand, increasingly it's playing a complex game of supply and demand. And I've tried to illustrate this um, with some of the elements that would play, play a part of that game here. So quickly we've got, for example, um, on the middle right there, you've got an energy storage device. That's a battery in a shipping container. And energy storage can do, can do lots of good things around reducing peak demand and reducing your energy bills. But when we look at a site, it might not stack up because obviously they cost a lot of money. But if, on the, um, if you have just plugged a lot of electric ambulances in and therefore increased your peak demand, energy storage now might stack up. And the same with solar. So if you've got lots of solar power on site, then you, you might help uh, make the case for energy storage because that way you can use the solar power at different times of the day to be, um, to be more beneficial. And as another example, if you've got electric ambulance charging and that's increased your peak electric demand, but you fitted lots of LED lighting which reduced your electrical demand, they might help balance out. And so if you go to the next slide, please, Chantal. Um, what, what we do when we work on these strategies is, is create a real-time uh, model of the, of the site. And so this, this green graph just shows you, it, it could be any site, any site, um, and showing a sort of day-night, typical day-night pattern that you'd expect to uh, electricity use increasing during the day and then declining during the night. But but by modelling it like this and looking at the impact of things in real time, you can minimise capex on technology. So we can work out what the optimum size of a battery should be, or the optimum size of a solar system should be, or, or whatever, to move that to, to maximise the benefit. You can get a smaller grid connection, which comes back to that point about um, electric vehicle charging. And this would apply on new build, but it would also apply on existing states where upgrading electrical capacity can be quite a challenge. By moving things around or using energy storage or smart demand side management as it's known, you can you can reduce that. You also get lower bills because we, we generally bills are we pay different prices for electricity at different times and ultimately you, you can reduce CO2 emissions which of course is what we're all aiming for. Next slide please. Uh, okay next slide please. Yes yeah, so, so new hospitals and click again please and again and again and again. Um, so for new hospitals, I won't, I won't focus on this too much, but most of what I've just said for existing estates are the same kind of things you'd consider for, for new hospitals. On new build, there's going to be a net zero carbon standard that comes out in April, or it's due out in April, and this will define what's required. But, but seeing as that isn't available at the moment, I just thought I'd briefly explain how we normally address net zero new development. There's broadly three categories of um, emission sources, suit emission sources. So there's operational, embodied and transport. And, and it's quite varied how organisations um, define net zero. So, so for example, some organisations, some authorities would define a net zero development that focuses only on operational energy. So the energy used in the, the buildings themselves. Um, increasingly, it's common to in, include in operational energy and the embodied energy, which is uh, the the suit emissions in the fabric building, the ME systems, the hard standing, that kind of thing. And the UK Green Building Council uses that pretty much standard methodology of, of including operational and embodied. Increasingly, though, we're actually beginning to see transport. I mean, we've worked on, I've worked on three master plans recently that have incorporated transport as, as some of the CO2 emissions and, and trying to account for them. Um, and, I, and I would expect that the NHS um, standard that comes out in April to include it all three of those elements, at least to some degree. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to briefly finish off with the how. Um, next again, oh, yeah, keep going. I think there's seven, so when you stop, we can get there. Um, thank you. So I, I just wanted to explain the process we would apply for um, existing NHS trusts, but this, and, and lots of other organisations we work with, but a lot of what I'm about to say applies perfectly well to new new developments as well. So, so when we're working on net zero strategy, I think to step through it briefly, you want a clear brief. So you need a clear goal. Where do you want to be? And what, how is that defined? And then normally the client has some sort of steering group or, or, or representative group that can work with us to, to, to work on the project. The next step is we create a baseline. So for existing trust, that's normally data from meter readings, fuel data. Sometimes you have to use modeling and proxies to, to fill in gaps. And then we model business as usual, which is what what you saw in that those that doc, um, those graphs I showed much earlier with the dotted lines. So what we try and work out is what will happen to your trust 
if, if you don't do anything because the because the world is changing even if, if we even if we're not so there's minimum energy efficiency standards on buildings vehicles are electrifying even if we don't do anything um, and of course many, many uh, trusts have got growth plans to improve healthcare so that's um, going to happen and then we get to the meat of um, our strategy work which is the stakeholders and analysis and it's it's a really it's a crucial part of the work so there's the intervention analysis which is sort of techy and, and nerdy and we do all the complicated modeling and analysis on what can make a difference but it's really really important that we engage with people across the organization so it's not just the energy team and the sustainability team but making sure the management team are, are buying into this understanding what it what it means for them and having their input the same for finance same for the clinical function uh, and maybe even the wider supply chain which helps get that buy-in but it also helps get a better strategy because it's it's been informed so that's the real meat of it and then, and then out the back of that you get your strategy which should be a robust plan with practical action not vague um, goals but practical actions time scales discussions around funding and responsibility and then you can move into the implementation phase um, which can take different forms um, but we should always include monitoring and feedback so, so that's a fairly standard process if you go on to the next slide please um, Chantal oh. Oh, that little red arrow just to show the iterative process. So it's uh, it's really difficult to, to capture how this in, in a page, but um, I wanted to uh, explain our, our thinking on some of how you go about uh, sort of funding and implementing this. The NHS strategy document is pretty light on funding, um, which it, and it acknowledges the need for UK government funding, and it does mention opportunities around changing contract requirements and trials and looking at internal carbon prices and so on. But I think it's fair to say there's a there's going to be a need for large scale investment and one of the ways we try and capture this for, for our clients is what you can see on the screen now which is called a marginal abatement cost curve or a MAC um, and I've just shown this one this is just an industrial site just to keep it anonymized but um, the uh, the principles of this are quite good in the sense of um, they can show on a page more or less the plan so what you've got there you've got a key with different measures that you could take to reduce the co2 emissions and so uh, ignore the, the the specifics but you can see the principles around things like led lighting and um, high efficiency motors and variable speed drives these kind of things and, and what what you do so you've got your 12 interventions there and what the mac does is map them in a techno economic way so if you start on the left there you can see that sort of orange bit uh, Norton one that's LED lighting and what that's saying is that's the most cost effective measure in this case to reduce CO2 emissions and you go far out on the right where you've got that brown square that shows that's the most expensive or the least cost effective way to reduce CO2 emissions and what the graph showing is the green line the vertical line you can see that's our target line in this case for this for this site and, and in simple terms what you would do is you would work from the left to right employing the most cost effective measures to get to that to that goal um, and that's that would then be the plan on a page. I think that there's a lot of um, caveats around that, and Max can oversimplify things, and there are things you need to think about. But as a principle, that's a good way to think about it. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much.